Thank you for joining me for session 10 in Explore the Bible, study of Ezekiel and Daniel. Uh, this is Daniel chapter 4, verse 28 to 37. Uh, the title is Humility Required, and the lesson summary statement is Believers Must Be Careful to Honor God in All Things. On the board, I've written a question. Uh, what do these people have in common? I have Jeff Zuckerberg, uh, Whoopi Goldberg, Tom Brady, Chesley Christ, Abu Ibrahim. And what I'm looking for is uh, these are people who at one time were on top of the world, and now they are not. Uh, Jeff Zuckerberg was the uh, chairman of CNN, and he's been released this week. Uh, Whoopi Goldberg uh, made a comment that didn't set well with the public, and so she's been suspended for two weeks. Uh, Tom Brady, of course, retired from uh, national football. And then uh, Chesley Christ was the USA Miss America and uh, sadly died uh, a young woman. And Abu Ibrahim is the terrorist of ISIS that was uh, killed today, this morning, that I'm we're filming this on Thursday, and that's just half a week. And there are many stories where people go from being on top to, to the depths in just a matter of moments. And this is what happened to Nebuchadnezzar in this story. And this, this story is teaching us this lesson, believers must be careful to honor God in all things. Now, in spite of appearances, Daniel tells us that God is in char charge. And Daniel himself illustrates for us what it looks like to live in covenant and to keep the covenant with God. Uh, despite Israel's unfaithfulness, Daniel, the book, is going to tell us that God will bring about his kingdom through one that's called the Ancient of Days. And those chapters are particularly emphasized in the last part of the book, in which we'll get into next week. The dream and the madness of King Nebuchadnezzar rips away the facade and shows who is really in control. It's not Nebuchadnezzar, it's God. It's God who's calling the shots. And despite the helpless condition of God's people here in Babylon, God wants them to know that he is sovereign and he is in control. And his sovereignty, the fact that he's in charge, he's in control, is to help them be careful to honor God in all things. Now, the first point of this lesson is pride declare. And either I will or maybe you would have someone in your class that you're wanting to develop as a teacher, but you could ask them or you could give a brief explanation for the background that leads up to this text about uh, Nebuchadnezzar and his dream and calling Daniel and Daniel interpreting that dream just to set the context for this passage. And then uh, you might want to spend some time describing how incredible the city of Babylon was. It really was a phenomenon in that world. And you can find information about Babylon in some of its more, more tremendous features. The outside wall was uh, 11 miles uh, long in terms of its, its circling. It had an inner wall that was wide enough that two chariots could be placed on those walls and go around. It had uh, like 50 temples. Uh, the parade route was um, nearly, was over half a mile long and it was over uh, 60 yards wide. Uh, the gates, there's some information in your material that describe the gates that were found there and there were eight great gates that displayed the greatness of uh, Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. N Nebuchadnezzar was not only a great builder, he also was a bit of a reformer when it came to uh, uh, the, the government and he was uh, making it more just, though we don't see very much of that uh, in the stories, uh, though he was a dictator. But you can go into some of the descriptions with the purpose of helping the people understand why, da why Nebuchadnezzar would stand up there and feel such pride and say the things that he would say. Stamped into every brick in uh, Babylon was the name Nebuchadnezzar. And so when he looked out across the city, the city was plastered with his name. 
And so you could read the text after uh, some of that description and helping them to see the scene and give some explanation to it. Verse 28, all this happened to Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, as he was walking on the roof of the royal palace in Babylon, the king exclaimed, is this not Babylon the great that I have built to be a royal residence by my vast power and for my majestic glory? This is the picture of an unchanged man. It's been 12 months since this uh, dream happened and he received the interpretation. And in chapter 4, verse 27, this is what Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar to do. He said that he should repent. Therefore, O king, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. So he's been told clearly what God's will is for his life and this call to repentance, but he has refused to do it. God has been patient with him all of this time. So the question I'm wanting to lead the class into is, was there anything wrong with Nebuchadnezzar being proud of what he had built? And then I want to lead that into, well, what about being proud of your family or being proud of getting a promotion? And I want to have a discussion about well, what is good pride? Is there such a thing as good pride? And you may want to Google on the internet some uh, Christian articles about that that would help to guide your thoughts on that. Just a discussion about good pride. And then where did, where did Nebuchadnezzar go wrong? One of the things you see is his pride is delusional. I mean, he, he failed to recognize God's sovereign role in, in, every, in everything about his life. I mean, the scriptures are telling us that God used him as a judge to come against his people, that God handed Hezek, the, the king of Judah over into uh, Nebuchadnezzar's hand. Uh, and all of these things were things that God had given him the power and the ability to do these things. And he failed to see God's sovereign role. And anything that removes God from his rightful place of sovereignty and authority is sinful pride. And this pride is an attitude or it's a spirit of the heart that reveals itself in many ways. If you'll notice on page 99 of the personal study guide, the way they have phrased this first point is this truth. People must be aware of their potential prideful declarations. So how do you overcome pride? If this is such a serious matter, then how do you overcome pride? And one of the things I want to do is take the class to chapter 4, verse 7 through 10, and read that text to them. And I want to point out that in that text, what we're talking about is seeing our self-will so that we humble ourselves to being obedient to God's will. For that's how you deal with pride. When you understand what God's will is, then you yield to that and you're obedient to it. I'll take them to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, where Paul tells this pastor, Timothy, to flee youthful lust. And we often think of that being something that has a sexual nature to it, and it obviously has that. But youthful lust also could involve this tendency towards pride and knowing everything. And so Paul is telling Timothy that he is to be humble and that he is to be obedient, and in doing so, rejecting those things, those desires that would pull him in that direction, away from God being priority, God being in authority, that he is, this is how he is to flee it. He's not to resist it. He is to run from it. And so that I'm wanting to use that to illustrate that the way that we deal with pride is we're humbly obedient and yielding to God's will. So we have to know God's will. And another passage that I'll take them to is Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. And that passage says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. So it would be disobedient 
to be anxious. But God gives us a formula. When we get when we get anxious, we're supposed to pray and we're supposed to be grateful and to be thankful. We're supposed to look at this ex this experience from God's perspective, and that would be a way of being obedient and yielded to God. The the point that I'm driving at here is Nebuchadnezzar declares his pride, and he is not seeing the full reality, which we're going to talk about in the next point. And so I'm wanting to build upon that. How, did, how could he have responded? Where is good pride at? Where is sinful pride at? And how do you deal with sinful pride? Now, the second point talks about the fact that uh, reality is defined, verses 31 to 33. Uh, the, this point is saying that Nebuchadnezzar is delusional. He believes something that's false. And what does he believe that's not true? And so I want to read through the text and ask them to keep that question in mind. What is it that Nebuchadnezzar is believing that's not true? While the words were still in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven. And your quarterly, your leader's guide, has good explanation for these verses that you may want to add to while you're reading through these. For example, the voice uh, came from heaven. That speaks of its authority. And uh, it says, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you, it is declared that the kingdom has departed from you. It is a word of judgment and displeasure on God's part. You'll be driven away from people to live with the wild animals, and you'll feed on grass like cattle for seven periods of time until you acknowledge that the Most High is ruler over human kingdoms and he gives them to anyone he wants. That, in a sense, is the essence of the book of Daniel, this passage right here. The Most High is ruler over human kingdoms and he gives them to anyone he wants. He repeats that statement twice more in this chapter. He says it in verse 17. He says it in verse 25. It is the theme of the book. It talks about seven periods of time. In this seven periods of time, uh, there's debate over what's the length of time. Most commentators believe that it's seven years. They've also found in historical records that the last section of Nebuchadnezzar's reign is not as well documented as the first section, which leads some to believe that it could indicate that this was the time in which he experienced this this this. Uh, animal-like behavior. It's interesting. Here's a man that's delusional in terms of being greater than humanity, and God gives him a delusion that makes him think of himself less than a human being. Verse 33 says, At that moment, the message against Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people. He ate grass like cattle, and his body was drenched with the dew from the sky until his hair grew like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird claws. He, he took on the animal world and the world of birds. Uh, apparently his hair was so matted it looked like uh, big clumps of feathers uh, that eagles would have. So the question again was, what, uh, what does he believe that's not true? And you may find some of the answers uh, on page 95, and I'll ask him to turn to that because again, I'm wanting to reinforce ever so often the importance of reading uh, their personal study guide before they come to Sunday school. Just gives me an opportunity to emphasize that. So at, on page 95, uh, one of the things they'll say, one of the things that says Nebuchadnezzar failed to recognize God as sovereign. Um, uh, he made the Jewish exiles eat from his table. God is going to make him eat from the field. Uh, he forced exiles to conform to his way of life and God is going to drive him out into the land and make him conform to the animal way of life. Uh, he thought himself superior to humankind and God made him less than humankind. And God told there was a way for redemption for this man. So I'm asking the question, you may find, uh, what, what does he believe that's not true? Now, how do nations and people act when uh, there's no transcendent authority to answer to. I'm going to repeat that question again. 
How do nations and people act when there is no transcendent authority that they must answer to? In our history, we know of uh, Nazism in Germany uh, during the 1930s and 40s, and they did not believe in God. Hitler and uh, his beliefs did not believe in God, and as a result of that, there were incredible acts of cruelty, brutality, and murder. We know this is true of nations today that don't believe in God, don't see a transcendent authority. And we see that in people as well. This, the reason why this is important is believers must be careful to honor God in all things. Why? This is acting according to reality. Otherwise, you're being delusional. The third point of this text is honor given. And again, I would read the text and give an explanation and, and uh, the leader's guide does an excellent job of giving these explanations. Uh, verse 34, but at the end of those days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven and my sanity returned to me. His looking up was a cry for help and, and uh, recognition that God was sovereign. Here's the same direction that the voice came to him when he was on the roof. Then I praised the Most High and honored and glorified Him who lives forever. Isn't it interesting that an act of worship, an act of praise is His first act after gaining sanity. For His dominion is an everlasting dominion and His kingdom is from generation to generation. He recognizes the endlessness of God's rule. All the inhabitants of the earth are counted as nothing and he does what he wants with the army of heaven and the inhabitants of the earth. There is no one who can block his hand or say to him, what have you done? There's no one who has greater power than God. And then at that time, my sanity returned to me. He has said that twice already. And my majesty and splendor returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and my nobles sought me out I was reestablished over my kingdom and even more greatness came to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, glorify the king of heavens because of all his works are true and his ways are just. He is able to humble those who walk in pride. And that is the moral of the story when it comes to Daniel chapter 4. Now I notice the question in the personal study guide on page 98. When it comes to this section, it asks this question. How does honoring and praising God help keep a proper perspective in life? Because we've just come from the place where he was, uh, he was out of touch with reality. And so how does, how does him giving praise and honor to glory help him gain perspective? So the first thing I want to do to get at that question is I want to ask the class, what are the qualities that of God that he praises and he gives honor to? And I'll list those on the board, things like uh, his sovereignty and his power uh, and his graciousness, uh, his eternal nature. And then, and then to ask the question, well, what does that mean that God's sovereign? Well, one of the things we're seeing from the book of Daniel is it means that you can trust God. Even with your pain and in your pain, you can trust God because God's sovereign. What about this idea of him being powerful? Well, we're seeing in the book of Daniel, it means that you can rely on this God during those times of testing and turmoil in your life because he is a powerful God. What about the fact that he's gracious? where we can see from the graciousness of God that he will not only see us through the pain, he will be with us in the pain. Now, the, my point is, is, as we're working our way through this text, we come across and we have this understanding of God, these beliefs like sovereignty and power and grace and eternalness. What are the applications? What are the implications for us that lead us to give praise and glory to God? Because what the question's driving at is this is what gave Nebuchadnezzar a perspective. 
And so it's a way of in, a way of getting at this idea of honoring God. Believers must be careful to honor God in all things. Now to close the lesson, I want to take that lesson summary statement and I want to kind of pull it apart here at the end instead of maybe at the beginning of the lesson. Notice again this point. Believers must be careful to honor God in all things. Look at the word must. Believers must. This is a word that's found frequently in the lesson summary statements in the book of Daniel. That word must means it's an obligation. It, it, it's something that compels us. So what is it that we are compelled to do? What are we obligated to do? He says to be careful to honor God. The word careful means to give attention to something, to be concerned about something, to be alert to it. So here he's saying, the, the writers of this lesson are saying, what we're learning from this story of Nebuchadnezzar is on our part, there is an obligation, there is a compelling issue, compelling motivation to be very careful, to be attentive, that we give honor to God. We show him respect. We give him praise. We treat him uh, as priority and as, and as having authority in our life. But notice it says we're to do that in all things. So what are some of the all things that would be included in that statement? And I'm sure you'll get answers like, well, time and talents and our family and my work and church. And it just is an endless when you say all things. So, the, the, so let's just work our way through one of those issues using these three points. For example, let's talk about our family. Look at the words that you use when you talk about your family. Now this says that it will reveal pride. Is it a good pride or is it a sinful pride? When you think about your family, and, and, the, and the beauty of your family, the, the success of your family, it's not all completely dependent upon you. There are relatives, there are friends, there are school instructors, there are coaches. There's a whole wealth of people who've come in around you and helped to shape uh, your children, your grandchildren into the beautiful people that they are. And so... Be careful, look at your words. Where does you, your words reveal that maybe you've, you've forgotten the role that God has played in building these people into wonderful people? The second thing is, what's the reality uh, when it comes to uh, these children and, or to your family? Uh, what... Um, what are you believing that's true about them? What are you believing that's not true about them uh, uh, when it comes to their devotion and to their significance and to their joy that they bring you? And then the third point, uh, honor given. How might your family be a source of praise on your part to God? And it help you recognize how wonderful he has been to you and what the real um, what the real work of God has been in your life. I hope that makes sense. I, I'm trying to take the points of the lesson and apply, this, the, apply them to the truth of this lesson. It is really a very powerful and compelling lesson. Uh, believers must be careful to honor God in all things. God bless you for teaching God's word.